Hi, I'm Pastor Stephen Pribble, pastor of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And I'm Brian Schwertley of Reformation Fellowship, Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America. Welcome to Reformation Forum, where we relate the unchanging truth of Scripture to current day issues. Tonight's subject is one that perhaps you've not heard of, but uh, maybe when we get into it, you'll, you will have some recognition. It's called eschatology. And Brian, just to get us started, tell us a little bit, what is eschatology and why is it important? Well, it's very, very important because eschatology is just a fancy theological word for the study of the doctrine of the final things. Now, that's usually divided by theologians into two categories. You have the study of personal eschatology, which deals with the death of human beings and what happens after death and the intermediate state. For example, when a Christian dies, his body goes in the ground and his soul immediately goes to heaven <clears throat> to be with Jesus Christ. When an unbeliever dies, his soul is separated from the body and his soul goes to hell and suffers torment in hell without the body. Okay, then there's general eschatology, and general eschatology deals with the second coming of Christ and the events uh, dealing around the second coming of Christ, and it also is a discussion of the millennium, the nature of the millennium, what does the millennium mean, and so forth. And these topics are very, very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Personal eschatology is very important because if you believe in a false doctrine, if you believe in annihilationism, that people just die out when they die, like a dog, or if you believe in reincarnation, and you don't believe in a biblical doctrine of what happens when you die, then you're not going to be concerned about your soul, and you're not going to be concerned about sin and turn to Jesus Christ. So that's very, very important. Also, if you have a false view of the future, as far as when is Christ coming back, the second coming of Christ, if you have a false view, if, for example, if you believe Christ is going to come next year, then you're not going to worry about building Christian hospitals and Christian colleges and universities, and, and uh, you're not even going to worry about leaving an inheritance to your children. So you have to have a biblical view of eschatology. It's very, very important. It affects all the other doctrines in a certain sense. Of, uh, for example, is there going to be victory of the gospel? Is there going to be worldwide victory? Is the kingdom spiritual or physical? All these things are very important and interrelated with the doctrine of eschatology or the study of the final thing. So really pay attention, folks. Really pay attention. You might want to tape the show for your friends. And we're offering a dynamite book tonight, a scary book. Uh, wrote it, me and Pastor Pribble put it together. It's called The Biblical Doctrine of Hell Examined. Now, this is a scary doctrine, I have to admit. This is a terrible doctrine. It's a doctrine that frightens me. This book even frightens me. But if you set, call us, give us a call, and we'll send this book to you free of charge. Hey, it's taught in the Bible. You know, we don't have any, you know, we have to teach this. It's taught in the Bible. Please send for this book. We'll mail it to you free of charge. And this is something you better know about. You know, Jesus Christ taught more about hell than all the other doctors, anybody else in the whole Bible. All the prophets and apostles combined, Christ taught more about hell than all of them combined. So please get this book. It's very important. Mm -hmm. You know, Stephen, <clears throat> what happens to men at death? Well, Brian, let me just go back all the way to the beginning, if I could. Uh, in the book of Genesis, we, we read the story of when God created the heavens and the earth. And the uh, account of creation is punctuated by recurring phrases such as, God saw that it was good. Uh, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And he was very pleased with his creation when he had finished making it. Death was not a part of the original creation. Uh, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that when sin entered into the world, death entered into the world. And let me read about that in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 2.17, God told Adam, he said, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And so God gave Adam fair warning. If you disobey me, you're going to die. Now I'm sure Adam didn't know all that that entailed. I'm sure uh, because he had never had any experience of death, he didn't know just how terrible that would be. But we learn that when Adam and Eve sinned and they ate of the forbidden fruit, <coughs> they didn't die physically, not right away at least. Their bodies began to decay, and death, bec because of that, becomes a part of our human experience. And every single family is going to experience death. If your family hasn't experienced it yet, the loss of a child or the loss of a parent, the loss of a loved one, you're sure to experience it. Because the Bible tells us in Hebrews 9 and verse 27, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. And so the Bible teaches that we are all going to die. And what this means is that our soul, the inner you, uh, 
not your body, not the material part that we can see, but the immaterial part, uh, which is known in the Bible by various terms as conscious, conscience or heart um, or spirit or soul. Uh, your soul is going to go either to heaven or to hell. And, uh, and so that's what happens when people die. When animals die, that's it. We've had pets die, and what we generally do in our family, we take the pet out into the backyard and we, we uh, dig a little hole, we have a little uh, ceremony, and, and we, we say goodbye to the animal, and that's it. But when uh, a human being dies, that's not it. <coughs> and you are going to be more conscious a, a second after your death than you are even all during your life. You're going to be somewhere, either with the Lord in heaven, or you're going to go ultimately to the lake of fire. Well, Brian, you've talked about uh, hell, and, and you've already offered the book, uh, The Biblical Doctrine of Hell Examined, and we've just mentioned the term, the lake of fire. Uh, some people teach, and I think you even mentioned this a little while ago, some people teach the doctrine of annihilation. Can you tell us what that is, and uh, is there any truth to that? Is that taught in the Bible? It's very unbiblical. It's a heretical doctrine, and it's a very dangerous doctrine because people make light of hell. Uh, Annihilation, basically, and this is taught by Jehovah's Witnesses, it's taught by Seventh-day Adventists. Annihilation is, is that at the day of judgment, the bodies and souls of men and women are destroyed in the lake of fire and completely burned up, and therefore there is a cessation of all existence. <coughs> Excuse me. And that is the doctrine uh, of annihilationism. The Bible does not teach that at all. That is totally heretical. It's unbiblical. And people make light of that. If you think, well, I can sin all I want. God's just going to wipe me out. No, no, no. Hell is forever. And let me li listen to these passages from Jesus Christ here. Jesus describes the suffering in hell. This is from Matthew 25, 46. He calls it everlasting punishment. In Matthew 18, 8, he calls it everlasting fire. And then in Mark 9, 45, he says, the fire that will never, that will never be quenched. And then... Uh, in Mark 9, 46, Jesus Christ says, the worm that never dies. And then the apostles totally agree with Christ. Listen to what the apostles say. Okay, in 2 Thessalonians, it's, it's called a flaming fire. Jude 6, it's called everlasting chains. Everlasting, did you hear that? And then in Jude 7, it's called eternal fire. And then in Jude 13, it's called the blackness of darkness forever. And then Revelation 14, the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And then it says here in Revelation 20, verse 10, the lake of fire and brimstone in which the devil, the beast, and the false prophet shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, if they were trying to say that you are going to be annihilated, boy, they're sure trying to fool me because I'm telling you, they emphasize it over and over. This is going to go forever and ever. This is everlasting. It's going to go on and on. Never-ending punishment forever and ever. You can't get around that, folks. They said it over and over and over again. They did not teach annihilationism. And here, here's some other arguments. In Matthew 26, 24, this is what Jesus Christ said. Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. He's talking about Judas. It would have been better for that man if he had never been born. <clears throat> now, if Jesus was, if, if the day of judgment brought annihilation of the body and soul, Christ could not have said that because from the standpoint of the one being annihilated, it is as though you had never been born. So Jesus is saying, look, it's better to have never been born than to die and live and go to hell and suffer forever. Mm -hmm. And if you're annihilated, then Jesus could not have made that statement. Here's another statement. Here's from Luke 12, and this is from 42 and, and 48. Uh, Jesus said that many, some will be beaten with many stripes. He's talking about after the judgment. And then some who disobey will be beaten with few stripes. Christ talks about... After the final judgment, those people who sin greatly, who did great wicked things, will suffer many stripes. So there's different degrees of punishment in hell according to how wicked you are. And then, of course, in Revelation 20, 13, it says, the dead were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. You see that? God judges righteously. The one who does uh, a little bit of evil will suffer not as much as the one who did like Joseph Stalin or Adolf Hitler. And then here's, here's a great one, Revelation 14, verse 11. Those in hell, it says, they will have no rest day or night. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Now, what is annihilationism? Annihilationism is a state of rest. Now, why do people commit suicide? Why do people blow their brains out and pop pills to kill themselves? Because they have trouble in life, and they think that dying is going to bring them rest. Mm. 
If you're watching this show right now, I'm telling you, I'm warning you. Okay, I'm warning you in Christian love. There is no such thing as annihilationism. When you die, if you shoot yourself in the brain, if you're not a believer, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell forever. There is no such thing as annihilationism. That's a false doctrine. And only cults believe that. The ch Christian church of all branches, East and West, Protestant, Roman Catholic, no one has ever accepted that doctrine because the Bible is crystal clear. And you have to take passages out of context and pervert the scriptures to teach that. So I'm telling you, I'm warning you. If you're watching this show, Give us a call. Get that booklet. Give us a call and repent of your sins and believe in Christ. This is serious stuff. Hell is a serious doctrine. And Jesus Christ warned us over and over and over. Why? Because he created hell. Jesus Christ is God and he wants you to repent. You know, Stephen, is it fair to God for God to send people to hell forever? Well, Brian, there are those that question God's motives in, in, in so doing. And uh, and there are those that would, would just rise up in protest and say, no, it's not fair. But the thing is that people that think like that are thinking from a humanistic point of view. They're not thinking God's thoughts after him. Uh, the Bible says that this is our responsibility. We must think God's thoughts after him. Uh, the Bible says that we're to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and we're to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. It is fair for God to send people to the lake of fire forever and ever. Because we have to remember that human beings are not innocent. They're not like a clean slate uh, you know, when they're born. Men are not uh, innocent and, and just uh, uh, you know, they're basically good. The Bible doesn't teach that we're basically good. In Isaiah 59 verse 2 it says, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And every single human being has committed iniquity, which is just another way of saying sin, which is an affront against God, a violation of his holy law. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. And so it is fair for God to send guilty sinners to the lake of fire forever and ever. It is fair because he did not owe salvation to anyone. If God had wished, he could have sent the entire human race to the lake of fire because of Adam's sin and no one would have been able to say, God, you were unfair. You shouldn't have done that. He did not owe salvation to anyone. The only reason that any of us is saved is because of his mercy. Because God, who is rich in mercy, has brought us to himself. And so it is fair for him to send guilty sinners to the lake of fire forever and ever. And we have to remember also, Brian, that all those that go to the lake of fire are those that refused to receive the gospel, that refused to receive the great salvation that Jesus Christ offers. And so those that have basically spit in God's face and say, said, I don't want your salvation, you know, they're going to get uh, well, what they Plus, they're deserve. in hell. They never repent in hell. They still hate Christ. They still hate God. They still have a wicked heart. So hell is where they belong. They don't change throughout eternity. And until they change and repent, I mean, which they never will do, apart right. from grace, hell goes on and on. It does. It's a scary doctrine, I'm telling you. It really is. And that's why you need to uh, give us a call, either of the numbers okay. that you see on the screen or, or send us a fax, and we'll be happy to send you this new booklet, the Biblical Doctrine of Hell Examined. <coughs> and uh, Brian and I were talking about this before the show. This is a scary book. Yeah, if you uh, want to just uh, believe a lie and you just want uh, someone to, to tickle your ears and tell you what you want to hear, don't send for this book. But if you want to know the truth, what the Bible says about hell, send for it. Absolutely free, without cost or obligation, we'd be happy to send you your very own personal copy. Brian, we've talked a little bit about it, and, and you've certainly uh, uh, alluded to it already in your answer, but what exactly is hell like? Hell is a terrifying place, Stephen, and uh, I'm just going to give you a, a summary. I really recommend that you get a copy of this book where I go into greater detail. But first of all, hell is described in the Bible, literally in the Greek, it's, it calls it in the Greek, the pit of the abyss. 